Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online Channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. Last Sunday, we started with a new series, okay? What's the series about? Truth Matters. It's a study on the Book of Acts, okay? But this week, okay, and next week, we will skip for a while this series and we will resume this series on January 27. Okay? So we will skip for two weeks. So therefore today I'm gonna give you a standalone message. Okay. And next week we will have a closure of our previous series. What's our previous series? Legit. Okay. There is still one more message that uh we need to give to you guys so that we close the series on the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, that will be next week. Okay, so, and, uh, but this morning, I want to talk about a story in the Bible which is a paradox. Okay, a paradox. Now, before I look at that story, let me first define what a paradox is. Okay, a paradox is an oxymoron. There are two things together, they're together, but they seemingly contradict each other. But both are true, okay? Both of these truth is true, but the problem is they are together, but they seemingly contradict each other, okay? So, example, example, press racing. You know how raisins are made? How are raisins made? They are grapes that are dried. So how can raisins be fresh? Okay. Another paradox is jumbo shrimps. You know a shrimp is small, right? And when it's, when, when it's a big shrimp, it's not anymore called a shrimp. What is it called? Prawns. But we use the term jumbo shrimp to tell us that it's a kind of shrimp that is big. Understand? So two things that are true, but at the same time it seems that they are what? Contradicting each other. Another example is escape, escape prisoner. Right? You're a prisoner, but at the same time you're free because you have escaped. So two things true, but it seems seemingly they contradict each other. And life, as in life, we are faced with many paradox. Okay? Let me give you an example. Okay? One paradox is this. Why do bad things happen to good people? Have you heard of that statement? Why do bad things happen to good people? During the Christmas break, we had some visitors. I was in. I spent my Christmas break in Malaybalay, and so we had some visitors. And one of them was a pastor okay, of another church. And he is 67 years old. Okay, he loves the Lord. He, I learned that uh, he gave up his business. Okay, gave up gave up his business to serve God. And you know his problem? He was diagnosed with cancer. And so you ask yourself, why do bad things happen to people like that pastor who loves the Lord, serves the Lord for so many years? Okay? Hard to explain, right? Another paradox in life is this. How can a good God allow evil things that we are seeing happening around us in this world? Right? Last night, if you are here, in our prayer watch, Brother Ted shared with us that so many evil things are happening. As a matter of fact, we, we see that in our own, in the comfort of our homes. We see that in, in the news, in the cable TV, right? So many things happening, evil things. That's a paradox, okay? Now, in the Bible, there are also many examples of paradox. Let me give you a few of them, okay? Jesus said, if you want to be strong, what must happen to you? You have to be weak. If you have to 
you have to go through weakness for you to be able to be strong. Okay? Another paradox that Jesus is teaching in Scripture is if you want to go up, if you want to be promoted, if you want to become a leader, if you want to become first, what must you do? You must be servant and slave of all. That's a paradox. Because in this world, what do they think? You want to be the leader, you want to be on top, step on people. Understand? That's a paradox. Another paradox in Scripture is this. If you want increase in your finances, what must you do? You give. But the world's way is, if you want to get rich, what must you do? Grab, okay? Hoard. But the teaching of Scripture is a paradox, okay? You want increase? Then give, okay? So, matter of fact, in, in the book of Acts, it says, In everything I showed you by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said. What did Jesus say? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Okay? Did you receive more gifts this Christmas than the gifts that you have given? Okay? So if you want to increase, what's the paradox? You have to what? You want to give. Another paradox, it says, if you want to save your life, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's a paradox. Two things together, but seemingly, they contradict. So this morning, I want to look at another paradox. And this is the paradox. Let's read. Why did Jesus have to die? Why is that a paradox? Because many of us would probably be saying, God could have done this. Instead of sending his son Jesus Christ to die for you and me, why did God not just say, okay, if you pray every day for the rest of your life, then your sins are forgiven. Or if you help the, the needy, okay, then your sins are forgiven. So matter of fact, some religion believe that God is merciful, that God is a gracious God, that he will show mercy and grace to people. When I went to Indonesia, when I was still in the corporate world, I was working with Metro Bottled Water, we wanted to visit a plastic, uh, bottle, plastic bottle manufacturing plant. And my guide was uh, uh, with us, and so as we were traveling, because it was outside of Jakarta, immediately he said, Bob, are you like that? He pointed at something. I said, what like that? Say, wait, wait, wait. We will, I will check again. Okay? When I see, I will point. Okay? So as the car was traveling, he saw this church. Okay? A church and he said, that one, that one. Okay? Are you like that? In short, that question was really what? He was asking my faith. What do I believe in? Okay? So am I a Christian or not? But before I answer this question, I told him, what do you believe? What do you believe? This guy, my, our guide was a, a Muslim. And so I said, what do you believe? How does one, in your belief system, how does one go to heaven? And so he now gives me uh, five things. He says, you have to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. I cannot, I cannot even memorize all of them. Okay? You have to read a few books and do a, lot, a few things. But he said, these five things you need to do. And I asked him, if you do that, completely the five things, will you enter the kingdom of God? Will you enter heaven and be with God? He said, uh, uh, no, no, no. You, you, you are not sure. We are not sure. Why are you not sure? Because you have done all of these five things. Why are you not sure? And he said, you know what? Even if you have done these five things, you still need the mercy and the grace of God. And I said, what if God does not show you mercy? What if God does not show you grace? Understand? So, this is a paradox. And there is a story in Scripture that shows this paradox. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 24, okay? Well, let's begin by reading verse 13 and 14. This is about uh, 
two people who were on the way to Emmaus, okay? Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, okay? Which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other. What were they talking about? They were talking about all these things which had taken place, okay? Now, what, what are these things? What are these things that they were talking about? They're talking about the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ. The paradox here is this. They were in their minds thinking that the Lord Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom and redeem Israel from the control of the Romans. But the paradox in their mind was this. We expected him to be that. But all of these things ended in what? In death. Now, I would imagine that these people, just like that pastor that I talked to this uh, Christmas vacation, they gave up everything to follow Jesus. And so what happens after the death of Jesus, they're confused. They don't understand why. We, we followed you and then it just ended this way. Okay? And I believe these two people that were walking towards the road of Emmaus were probably mad. And they were sad and disappointed and very emotional about what happened. Okay? Let's continue. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Okay? Now, Jesus slowly, okay, walks with them. And what happened? Look at verse 16. But... Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Jesus now comes and walks with them, but they don't recognize him. In life, we travel the road of life, right? What prevents us from seeing Jesus? As you and I are traveling in the road of life, my question is this, are you mad, are you sad, are you disappointed and emotional? These two people did not recognize Jesus. Why? Why? Because they were mad, they were sad, they were disappointed. Many times when we face disappointments because there are issues that happens in our life, we, we feel the pain, we feel the sadness, we become emotional, then therefore we don't see the perspective of God. That's why be, be very careful as things happen this year, 2019. There will be things that will happen in our lives, right? Sad things, bad things, and even evil things that will happen in our lives. But if you are mad and sad and disappointed, you might not recognize what God is doing in your life. Okay? And so, as they were walking, he said to them, because remember, they were discussing. Jesus asked them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? Notice what happened to them. They stopped. Okay? They stood still. And notice, they were looking what? Sad. Okay? So my question to all of us is this. What are you mad? What are you sad? What are you disappointed and emotional about? Do you have those things? Because if you're harboring those things, then you might not recognize what God and Jesus Christ is doing in, in your life. Okay? Okay? And so they answered, verse 18, one of them named Cleophas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of things which have happened here in these days? Because in their minds, what happened to Jesus was known all over Jerusalem. Okay? And he said to them, notice, Jesus when we ask a question, we'll often respond with a question. And so he responds by saying, what things? What things? And they said to, to him, the things about Jesus 
the Nazarene. And then they describe what happened to Jesus or who Jesus is. He says, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word in the sight of God and all the people. And then the next verse says, this Jesus, how the priests and the rulers and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. And notice the paradox in verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. That's the paradox. They followed Jesus. They know, they hope, they expect that they will be redeemed from, uh, that, they, that Israel will be redeemed from the control of the Romans. But what happened is it ended in death. That's why they, they're confused. They, they don't understand. They even, and indeed, they said, beside all this, it is the third day since these things happen. I would think, I would just think, okay, this is just my thinking. Maybe these two people remembered and what Jesus had told the disciples. That the Son of Man will suffer and will rise again on the third day. So in their mind, another paradox. Where is he? Three days. He's not, he has not risen. But they do not know that Jesus was beside them. But they don't recognize. Why? Because they were mad. They were sad. They were disappointed and very emotional on what just happened. Verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And Jesus said, Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? What is Jesus saying? What Jesus is saying is this. Let's read this together. Go. Don't you get it? It was prophesied and it is necessary and necessary must that the Christ had to die. In short, what Jesus was saying to Cleophas and his, the person beside him together walking in the road to Emmaus was saying this, don't you get it? It was necessary that Christ has to suffer and, and what? Bring to glory. Now, why is it a necessary must that Christ had to die, okay? Why is it a necessary must? In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, I think you're all familiar with this. If you've been with us for a while, we've been flashing this in some of our messages. What does it say? Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, okay? So, what does this verse tell us? There is an appointment. I know you and I sometimes, we cancel appointments. Do you cancel appointments sometimes? Maybe you're stuck in traffic and it's already 30 minutes for your appointment and you know you will not, uh, it will take you another hour to be freed from the traffic. What do you do? You text the person that you're supposed to meet, that appointment, and say, you know what? I am here in traffic. I don't think I can be there in another hour. Can we just cancel the appointment? Let's meet tomorrow at uh, the same time, same place. Okay? Have you canceled appointments lately? Okay, sometimes, right? We cancel appointments. But can I tell you, this is the only appointment in your life that you can never cancel. Why? Because if it is your appointed time, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, then you will physically die. Okay? So, in short, what are we learning? We are all on our way to death. Do you, do you believe that statement? Someday you and I will die, okay? Until you embrace the truth, okay? The problem today is this. I was teaching my D group in, uh, I think, Tagum or Jensan. I said, the problem is this. Because of the advances in, in, uh, medica, in the medical field, okay? It seems that people don't appreciate anymore this, 
that we are all on our way to death. But if you live a hundred years ago, you will know that in a family, in a family, say of eight, there are at least one or two child who is born who will die. So in short, death for them was a reality. Our problem today is this. Because of the advances in the medical field, it seems that we are able to prolong what? Life. Understand? And so therefore, we don't want to die anymore. Okay? We want to, to uh, avail of all the resources, the best doctors, the best equipment, the best hospital. Why? Because we don't want to die. But you need to accept the fact that we are all on our way to death. We will all die physically. But at the same time, notice the blue letters, blue words. After you die comes what? Judgment. In short, there will be a spiritual judgment that will happen. And the question is this. What will be the judgment all about? What will be the basis of the judgment? Can I just share with you? Let's read verse 23. Go. All have seen, without exception, and all of us fall short of the standards of God. And this problem started in the book of Genesis. It started with Adam and Eve. God told Adam, this is what God told Adam, the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. What God was saying to Adam was this. This garden, with all the fruits, with all the trees with its fruits, you can enjoy all of them. Okay? I don't know what fruit you like so much. Okay? Do you like uh, chico? Durian? Banana? Uh, apples? Persimmon? I don't know what you like. I think all of them are there. And God was saying to Adam, Adam, you enjoy everything. You enjoy yourself. Okay? But it is a conditional thing. But, he said, but. There's a contrast. Okay? What's the contrast? From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. All the rest you can eat. But don't eat from this tree. Okay? Why? Because the moment you eat of the fruit of the tree of the uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what is the consequence? For in the day you eat from it, you will what? Surely, you will surely die. Okay? Now, you know the story, right? Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because he ate of the tree, what happened? Death entered the world. Do you know that you and I are not designed by God to die? God designed you and me to live forever. Do you agree with that statement? You know why I say that? Because he says, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, except what tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And out of this any tree, the many trees that they can eat, one of those trees is what? What is one of those trees? The tree of life. The tree of life. And God was saying, in this, imagine this is the garden, okay? In the middle is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the corner was the tree of life. Are they allowed to eat of that? Yeah, because God said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, including what? The tree of life. Now, if they just obeyed God, maybe they could have eaten. Because if I were Adam, I would try all of the fruits, okay? Mm, durian, uh, bad smell, but, uh, but I think maybe the tree of uh, 
good and evil is durian. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> you know why? Can I tell you why? This is my theory, okay? This is not biblical. I think the tree of uh, the, the knowledge of good and evil is durian. You know why? Because it smells like hell and tastes like heaven. Do you agree? <laughs> okay, so they were allowed to eat from all of the trees, including the tree of life. And if I were Adam, I would taste all of it and definitely I will come to the tree of life and will eat of the tree. And what will happen to me if I eat of the tree of life? I will live forever. That is how gracious God is to us. We were not designed to go to hell. We were made by God to live forever. But our problem was Adam disobeyed God. And so therefore, when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin entered the world. And so because of sin, what's the consequence? For the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. I want to expand this some more, okay? And answer the question. Let's read the question. Go. What did death deliver to us? By answering this question, then we will be able to answer the first question, which was a paradox, which is why did Jesus have to die? And so by answering this second question, I hope and pray it will clarify and make us understand why Jesus had to die. And I want to show you four Ds, okay? D, 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 okay? What was the first thing that death delivered to us? Number one, disagreement. You and I were born with a nature that disagrees, okay? We disagree. Why do I say that? Because Paul said, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Because you were dead in your trespasses and sin, what happened to you? We, we walk formerly, we formerly walk according to the course of this world. We were born with a nature or disagreeable nature, okay? Because that's the ways of the world. According to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedient. So we have a disagreeable nature. We were born with agreement with the world and not with agreement with God. That's why we are described as what? Sons of disobedience. We say, I don't want to follow your will. I don't want God's will. I want my own will. Understand? So we are born with a nature of disagreement, okay? And we experience that. As a pastor, I've been pastor for so long. There will be people who will come to worship and say, you know, I don't like the music, it's so loud. <laughs> the aircon is so hot. Then the next week, the aircon is too cold. You never satisfy them. Why? Because we have a disagreeable nature. That's why when you and I come to the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, we confess. What do we confess? By the way, the word confess means homo logeo in the original language. Confess means to agree. You agree. So when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, what do we agree? We agree and tell the Lord, Lord, I've been in disagreement with you and with God the Father. Why? Because of my disobedience. That's the first thing that death delivers to us. What is that? What's the first thing? Disagreement. The second thing that death delivers to us is distance. Okay? Why do I say distance? When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate of the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, okay, the man and his wife, what did they do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, where they hid themselves from the trees. And God asked them a question. The Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard you, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was what? 
I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And because of that, God said, let's read verse 22, very important, go. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat. And then what happens? That is the heart of God. God is saying, eat of any tree, including the tree of life. And if you eat of the tree, you will live forever. But the problem now is this. They disobeyed God, and because they disobeyed God, and if they eat of this tree, what will happen to them? They will live forever. Because that's what is the effect if you eat from the tree of life. But the problem is this. If they partook of the fruit of the tree of life, they will truly live forever, but they will live forever in sin. And God hates sin, right? And so therefore, because of this death, the wages of sin is death, it caused, it resulted to distance. Why do I say distance? Because, therefore, God, the Lord God, sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. Sin results to death, and death delivers distance from God. In the New Testament, Paul describes this in a different way. He says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, distance, okay? Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That is the result of death. It delivers distance. We were separated from God. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened? What happened? And I'm, I'm challenging my D group in Tagum to read the Bible, we will read together, okay? So I told them starting January 1, read four chapters, we'll begin with the book of Matthew, okay? So we're now in the book of Luke, okay? And the other day, uh, I ended uh, the book of Mark, okay? And one of the verse that I saw there is this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happens? The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Usually, we start from the bottom and tear a cloth when it's hanging, right? You cannot cut from the top to the bottom. In short, this is something that God allowed. Now, why is this very important, the veil of the temple? If you are familiar with uh, the book of Exodus, who can enter the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest. How many times? Once a year. Nobody can enter the Holy of Holies except the high priest. And he has to go through the veil. Okay? He has, to, he has to go through the veil. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, this veil in the temple in Jerusalem was torn into from top to bottom. What is the implication? The implication is this. You now have access to God. You can now. You don't have to go to the high priest. You yourself can now have access to God. That's why in the book of Hebrews, it says, draw near to me with what? With confidence. Why? Because you will now have access. That distance that was created or delivered by death has now been removed. Okay? So what's the first thing again? Death delivered what? A nature of disagreement. It also caused what? Distance between us and God. The third thing that death delivered is despair. Why do I say despair? Paul in the book of Romans tells us this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage of sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. What does he not understand? For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but 
I am doing the very thing I hate. So in short, in his mind, this is something that I need to do. This is the right thing to do. But in his flesh, he does something exactly the opposite. And then he continues by saying, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. And he says, For the willing is present in me, meaning the mind is law abiding, but, but what? The flesh, the body, the doing of the good is not. Okay? And then in verse 19 he says, For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And so he describes himself in verse 24, wretched man that I am. So desperate. Okay? And then he asked the question, who will set me free from the body of death? Folks, we have a body of death. We need to be set free. And that is what death delivered to us. Despair. Okay? But why did Jesus have to die? The answer to the question of Paul, who will set me free from the body of this death, is found in verse 25. And he says, thanks be to God that through Jesus our Lord. So, so then, he says, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. He was in his mind law abiding, but his flesh continues to do the opposite. Okay? But who will set us free from this despair? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So what's the first day again? Disagreement. What's the second one? Distance. What's the third one? Despair. The last one that death delivers to us is defeat. Another word for defeat is loss. Okay? Or destruction. In the book of Revelation, it says, For the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the immoral persons, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is described as what? The second death. We will experience another death. Not only the physical. That's why the Bible says we are appointed to die once and after that judgment. And we will be judged. We either go to eternal death or eternal life. But because of sin, death delivers a loss. Death delivers defeat. Death delivers destruction. Why do I say that? Because if you look at Revelation 20.10, what happens to us in that lake of fire? The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are also. They will be what? This is the destruction. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is the cause. That is what sin gave us because the wages of sin is death, and death delivers what? What's the first one? Disagreement. It delivers distance. It causes despair. It causes death. So the question is this. Let's read the question. Who is going to deliver to us or us from this death? Who? Remember the paradox we want to answer? Why did Jesus have to die? And the answer is found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 47. Let's read together. Go. Therefore... Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. What did Jesus do? Since the children share in flesh and blood, meaning because we are human, okay, flesh and blood, what did Jesus do? He himself also partook of the same. Meaning, here is the Son of God. He became what? Man. He partook of flesh and blood. And then he says the true death, because he's now man, but at the same time God, 
And so therefore he was crucified on that cross and he experienced that, that through death he might what? Render power him who had the power of death. Who had the power of death? The devil. Okay? So the question is this. How did Jesus render the devil powerless? How? How did he do that? In verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 2, he says, But we do not see him who was made for a little while lower than angel, angels, namely Jesus. Why? Because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. So that, so that purpose, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Remember, sin is independence. From God. And so when Adam and Eve went to the tree in the middle of the garden and ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, then they disobeyed God. They experienced death because God said, you will surely die. But what Jesus did was this. He, un he went to Calvary. Okay? He went to Calvary to undo what happened to Adam and Eve and to us. Okay? He went to Calvary, and Galatians tells us, in, I think in chapter 3, curse is the man who hangs on a tree. Okay? The, the tree in the garden was the tree of disobedience. But Jesus went to another tree. Not anymore the sin, the tree of disobedience, but the tree of what? Obedience. Okay? The first Adam brought death. But the second Adam, Jesus, brought life. Why? Why? Because on the tree, on that cross, Jesus swallowed the holy wrath of God. Remember, God is a holy God. He hates sin so much. He cannot just tell us and say, you know what? Just pray every day and you will go to heaven. That cannot work. Just do good works and you will go to heaven. That will not work. Why? Because there is a consequence to sin. And instead of us going through that, Jesus embraced the tree, the cross and swallowed the holy wrath of God that he poured upon Jesus. Why? Because he carried all of our sins in his body. And God hates sin so much. And therefore, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, what did God do? He poured out his holy wrath. And Jesus swallowed all of it. That's why you will now understand why Jesus said, My God, my God, why? As thou forsaken. There was separation. There was separation. The fellowship between the father and the son was broken. So my question as we close this morning is this. What is keeping you from the outstretched arm of the cross? What is keeping you? Let's go back to the story in the book of Luke. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. The problem is Jesus vanishes from their sight. Maybe God has brought you here today. And just like Cleophas and the person with him, I believe the person with him was his wife. Okay, so this couple recognized Jesus. And maybe you're here today. God has brought you here. And he has opened your eyes to let you hear and understand why Jesus had to die. So how will you respond? How will you respond? This couple, Cleophas and I believe the wife, Notice what happens in verse 33. What did they do? They got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? 
Because Jerusalem is where Jesus was crucified. They went back to where the cross was. So today, I believe you are here because God wants you to turn, just like this couple, to turn back to the cross, to get back to God. Let me close with this passage in the book of 1 Peter. What does it say? Let's read together. Go. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Let's, let's dissect this. Remember, we want to answer the question, why did Jesus Christ have to die, right? It says, for Christ also died, why? For sins. How many times? Once. And for whom? For all. Does that include you and me? Yes. The just. Who is the just? Jesus. No sin. For whom? The unjust. Who is the unjust? Who? Tell your neighbor, you are the unjust. <laughs> really? And tell him, you are also the unjust. So, the just, Jesus, no sin for the unjust, us sinners. Why? So that, what is the purpose? So that he might bring us to God. And some people will say, you know what? Jesus died for you. Why? He wants to bring you to heaven. No, 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 no. That is not what scripture is saying. Jesus came, died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again from the dead on the third day. Not to bring us to heaven, but to do what? Let's read the, the blue box. So that he might bring us to God. Heaven is just a bonus because that is where God is. Understand? So the reason why Jesus had to die is so that you and me will be brought back to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So if you're here today, God brought you here. You did not bring yourself here. He brought you here so that you will turn around and go back to the cross and get back and get back to God. And if you're here today, God has spoken to you. You now understand. And I want to pray for you. Okay? I want to pray for you. And I pray that you will embrace the cross because that is where salvation is. Jesus Christ died for all of your sins. He was buried and rose again from the dead. Let's all rise as we close in prayer. I want us all to pray this prayer, okay? Aloud. I will pray this so that the others uh, will not be ashamed to pray. So let's help them. And maybe some of you would also want to make a commitment, recommitment to the Lord. So let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for your death. I know you did it for me. I could not save myself. But by your death, you saved me. And it is because you were raised from the dead. I believe that you are alive now. Help me to see God. Help me to be aware of your presence even now. I confess. You as my Savior, I believe in my heart that you were crucified, but you were raised from the dead on the third day. I thank you today for the forgiveness of all my sins. I thank you today for giving me eternal life. Amen. Thank you and God bless to everyone.